Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Jasmine. Uh, thanks for having me. Uh, thank you very much, Agnes, for that very kind uh, words for of uh, HKUST and our Institute for Emerging Market Studies. Thanks also to Andrew, whom we work with very closely for the reports, uh, as well as to your team. Uh, so what I'll do to kick off the event is really talk about uh, the two reports that are on your chairs, uh, the, the first two that Agnes referred to. Uh, the first one... Uh, on how Hong Kong, as it integrates into the Greater Bay Area, how it should maintain its distinctive positioning. Uh, we think that increasingly Hong Kong needs to sharpen its complementarities, uh, needs to sharpen its comparative and deepen its comparative advantages uh, as it integrates into the Greater Bay Area. In fact, our argument in this first report is that uh, the more Hong Kong does that, the more Hong Kong offers a distinctive value proposition, the more useful it is uh, and the more it can bring to the Greater Bay Area. And one way in which we can, we think that Hong Kong can sharpen its distinctive positioning, uh, is to deepen its links, right? And deepen its, uh, trade connectivity, uh, with the Southeast Asian market. Why? Because Southeast Asia is really the most dynamic emerging market outside of China. Its population is still growing. It's got a young population. And so that's the subject of our second report. How should Hong Kong, uh, sharpen and develop its linkages with uh, the largest emerging market outside of China in this part of the world, which is Southeast Asia. So let me start with the big picture. And of course, the big picture is that since the, can the mic pick me up? Since the global, uh, since the global financial crisis of uh, 2008 to 2010, uh, global trade has slowed, right? It is before the global financial crisis, global trade grew faster than uh, global output, right? Growth in global trade, uh, was uh, outpaced growth in global output. Since the global financial crisis, that has turned around. Now, this doesn't mean that we're entering a new age of deglobalization. I, I don't think we should get too carried away. Deglobalization suggests that globalization is reversing. That isn't happening. What, what we do see is a slower form of globalization. We're seeing moves towards uh, regionalization. We're seeing moves towards, particularly as this pandemic has highlighted, uh, localization. And we are seeing a reconfiguration, not necessarily a reshoring, which means global value chains being brought home, but we are seeing a reconfiguration of global value chains. Now, these trends are likely to be long term. Uh, the pandemic and of course the US China trade war of 2019 has made these trends more salient, but they are likely to be long term, uh, reflecting changes in global sentiment towards globalization, reflecting, uh, trends towards technology decoupling. So it's a whole multitude of factors that are driving this. Uh, now, Hong Kong is probably the world's most trade-dependent economy. I'm from Singapore. When I was in Singapore, I used to think that Singapore was the most trade-dependent economy in the world. Uh, trade is more than three times GDP. When I came to Hong Kong, it's nearly four times. Uh, Hong Kong's trade, uh, imports plus exports, is more than nearly four times uh, its GDP. So Hong Kong is probably the world's most trade-dependent economy. So in the context of slower globalization, a reconfiguration of value chains, all that has profound implications right, for future prospects of the Hong Kong economy, for, uh, for trade uh, in, in Hong Kong. The good news is that there is this Greater Bay Area right at our, at our doorstep, right? Hong Kong is part of the Greater Bay Area, probably the most entrepreneurial, dynamic, uh, and creative part of the Chinese economy. Uh, and Hong Kong should fully exploit the opportunities that are available in the Greater Bay Area. They're significant, what I'm an economist, so what economists call uh, economies of agglomeration, right? The fact that you can plug into this huge network, a huge uh, hinterland, and benefit from larger scale uh, uh, and, 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 and larger markets. Uh, at the same time, though, there are some risks, right? Uh, so what our first report does, or one of the things our first report does, is highlight the experiences of other smaller economies as they integrate that into larger markets. So whether it's economies like Finland, or Denmark as integrated into the European uh, Union, or even Singapore in the context of Southeast Asia. What were some of the risks that they had to manage? Uh, and we highlight a few in, in the report. The first, of course, is that firms and talent, uh, is a perennial concern in Hong Kong, of course, may leave for better opportunities, right? Uh, more abundant opportunities in the larger market, in the hinterland. Second, which of course we've seen 
uh, in Hong Kong has been the hollowing out of manufacturing. Uh, so what this chart shows is um, the blue line represents the share of manufacturing in Hong Kong, and you see it's you know virtually non-existent. Uh, the the yellow line represents the share of manufacturing in Singapore, right, which is the other very expensive city state. And what it shows in Singapore is that the state, through industrial policies, through various uh, proactive measures, activist policy measures, has maintained manufacturing as a share of GDP uh, at about 18%. Now, we can have a long discussion, in fact, I teach a course on this, on whether that has come at the expense of efficiency and productivity gains. I think it has, right? But it has also given the Singapore economy more resilience. Uh, so you are trading away efficiency, but you are gaining uh, resilience. Uh, Hong Kong, probably a more efficient economy since fewer government interventions. With government interventions, there's more potential of distortions, but you might be losing strategic options and, and, and strategic depth. Uh, so we can talk a lot more about the hollowing out of manufacturing and what that does for opportunities for technology transfer, what that does for opportunities for upgrading in the, uh, and technology learning. Uh, third is that, yeah, as I mentioned, the loss of a manufacturing arguably reduces opportunities for technology transfer and, and, and technology learning. And fourth, of course, is a less diversified economy. So you're more exposed, the Hong Kong economy is probably more exposed to idiosyncratic uh, sector-specific risks, as we have seen in, 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 in during COVID-19. Uh, so some charts to illustrate that, you know, the downstream costs of uh, of that hollowing out, of that loss of diversific uh, loss of uh, economic diversity has been, for instance, if you look at R&D, right, we all know that you know, the future of Hong Kong has to be in these knowledge-based, knowledge-intensive, technology-intensive activities. And the foundation for that is R&D spending. Uh, across small economies, advanced small economies, Hong Kong's spending in GDP as a share of GDP, uh, spending on R&D as a share of GDP is uh, among the lowest in the world, or if, if not the lowest in the world. Uh, you see that reflected also in startups, right? how conducive Hong Kong is for uh, global startup uh, for, for for startups. So this is a quite a probably the most comprehensive report on how conducive uh, city is for for startups. And Hong Kong ranks well behind uh, other leading Asian cities such as Beijing, Shanghai, Shenzhen, Singapore, uh, in 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 this uh, in this global startup ecosystem report. Uh, and finally, this is the uh, Bloomberg's. Uh, 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 innovation uh, index, right? The, the world's most uh, six, six, the world's most innovative economies. If you look at the top ten, and Hong Kong, by the way, is not in the top ten. If you look at the top ten, almost all of them are relatively small economies of around Hong Kong's size. Right? So size is not, and scale are not impediments to having a highly uh, innovative economy. With the exception of South Korea, Germany. Uh, and the Netherlands, you know, the other seven economies in the top 10 are either around Hong Kong size or slightly smaller. So what we argue in the first report, and this is as good a summary of the main argument in the first report, is that, you know, unless Hong Kong takes deliberate policy steps, uh, takes deliberate measures to identify, develop, and exploit new niches, right, and new opportunities, and unless it maintains its distinctiveness, uh, there is a meaningful loss, lo uh, risk of further loss of economic activity and an erosion of competitive strength in key sectors. Yes, there are substantial opportunities in the GBA, and of course, Hong Kong should do everything it can to exploit those opportunities, to, to benefit from those uh, economies of scale, those agglomeration effects. Uh, but it, so, it should also keep an eye right, and pay particular attention to identifying and developing new niches. And in fact, we argue that the two are interlinked the more Hong Kong can enhance its distinctive positioning, the more it is in a position to integrate uh, into, into the GBA economy and to take advantage of those opportunities. Right? So you know, the more successful Hong Kong is in upgrading its, the distinctiveness of its economy, the more it can fully exploit the opportunities from GBA integration. It needs to do the former well to fully maximize uh, the latter. Uh, so let me move on to the second report because uh, it, the second report follows, you know, uh, quite logically, I think, uh, from the first report. And one way in which we think Hong Kong can, you know, distinguish itself, can strengthen its distinctive uh, value proposition in the Greater Bay Area, 
is as this gateway, right? As Agnes was saying, not just to the mainland, but as a gateway for mainland enterprises, for mainland companies into emerging markets and to Southeast Asia in particular. Uh, you might ask why Southeast Asia? So in our second report, we highlight what's, what's the argument for Southeast Asia. So we think uh, Southeast Asia, after a long period, I think after the Asian financial crisis, when companies uh, diversify out of Southeast Asia and move a lot of their investments to, to the mainland, uh, Southeast Asia is now coming back as a potential uh, investment destination for multinationals, including uh, Chinese multinationals. Uh, so that's one aspect of it. The other aspect, of course, is that Southeast Asia in the last decade or so has been making significant uh, supply-side reforms, right? significant investment, uh, in, uh, infrastructure investments, uh, labor, supply, uh, labor market reforms, particularly in large economies such as Indonesia, uh, recently passed an omnibus bill, which has, is very significant in terms of freeing up its labor market. Uh, uh, so, so these supply side reforms are fueling uh, and attracting more FDI, and I'll show you a chart in a couple of seconds why, to illustrate uh, the attractiveness of Southeast Asia to multinationals. Uh, third, Southeast Asia is probably the only region in the world that is still very keen on globalization. Name me another region in the world where there isn't a backlash against globalization, where there isn't a rise in populist uh, nationalism. Yet, this is largely absent in Southeast Asia. It's still very welcoming of foreign tech, whether Chinese or American or Western tech. It is still very uh, open to global flows of capital and to global investments. Uh, and that is probably most best illustrated with the signing of probably the world's most comprehensive uh, regional trade pact, the uh, Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, which incidentally Hong Kong is not a signatory to. So one of the urgent things that Hong Kong needs to do if it is to benefit from this uh, you know, resurgence of interest, of investor interest in Southeast Asia, is to, uh, is to, part is to join the RCEP. Right? Uh, now, some of you might say, with all these concerns around deglobalization and technology decoupling, and wouldn't multinationals be reshoring, moving their production bases back home? Uh, so this chart by McKinsey uh, shows that those concerns are probably overstated. Uh, so this is a survey that they did of uh, multinationals in, in the region. And they said, what were they planning to do? This is done uh, at the height of the pandemic last year. What were they planning to do to build resilience? And you look at the top highlighted responses, dual sourcing of raw materials, right? Uh, near shoring, the third one, near shoring and expanding supply bases, uh, regionalizing their supply chains and creating backup production sites. So these were among the top six of their responses. Uh, none of this suggests that they are moving back their production facilities, right? Now they suggest that they are reshoring. Instead, these are things that suggest that they will pursue a China plus one strategy, right? They will still have a substantial or significant presence in China, but they're going to diversify. They'll hedge a little, right? And they'll uh, create or invest more in neighboring markets. And if you think about that, who is likely to benefit from these trends? Dual sourcing of raw materials or regionalizing the supply chain? It is most naturally Southeast Asian economies. Not say South Asia, I don't think. Certainly not India. Uh, possibly Bangladesh, but the big I suspect the big winner uh, regionally would be Southeast Asia. Uh, this is another, uh, these are actual announcements made by companies on, uh, in 2020-21 on relocation announcements, right? And you look at uh, manufacturing, so different types of activities, manufacturing sales offices, regional headquarters, and where, where are these new uh, relocation, uh, loca uh, new location in, uh, locations going to go to. In, man in the case of manufacturing, the first one, China, followed by ASEAN, right? The ASEAN economies. In the case of sale offices, China again, ASEAN followed by Japan and Korea. Regional headquarters, business services, China, next ASEAN, uh, then Japan and Korea, and, and also Hong Kong, uh, Hong Kong, China. Uh, data center and customer contact centers. Southeast Asia is also uh, highlighted as one of the a preferred destinations for these sorts of relocations. Uh, this is yet another of these uh, surveys, uh, company surveys, on how companies view uh, the attractiveness of alternative uh, locations for their global value chain. So if it's green or dark green, it is 
very attractive. If it's red or dark red, it is not so attractive. But you look at some of the Southeast Asian markets, they are extremely viewed as extremely suitable for the transfer of global value chains. Malaysia, mostly uh, green or dark green, except for labor costs. Thailand, uh, sorry, Indonesia and Thailand, also the same, uh, the, the same case. So, you know, multinationals still view Southeast Asian economies as a relatively attractive and suitable place for the transfer of their global value chains. Uh, so what does all this mean for Hong Kong? And, uh, in, in, in our Q&A, I'll, I'll, I'll be happy to address some of these questions. First, of course, Hong Kong is in a fantastic position. Southeast Asia is already Hong Kong's second largest trading partner after the mainland, uh, both for imports as well as exports. Um, uh, and the supply chain reconfigurations that we see happening across the world, but also particularly in this part of the world, uh, would increasingly spur investments into Southeast Asia as companies, multinationals, including Chinese multinationals, look to pursue a China plus one strategy. What the last chart I have here shows is, you, know, you look at uh, wage growth in places like Indonesia, Vietnam, Thailand, uh, uh, and Philippines. Yes, there's been some wage growth, but that wage growth has lagged that in the mainland. Uh, one of the forces that are pushing out uh, low-value added labor-intensive uh, manufacturing activities in China has been the rapid increase in Chinese wages, uh, driven by a whole lot of factors, including demographic factors. Uh, that wage growth has been much more subdued in Southeast Asia, and so that creates uh, that gives it a, a cost advantages, right? And finally, of course, Southeast Asia is a huge market, right? It's a population of more than 600 million people, much younger than the Chinese population, still growing. Uh, although it wouldn't replicate the kind of huge uh, labor supply boost that China gave to the world in the 1990s to until recently, it is nonetheless a very significant uh, expansion of uh, market opportunities, a very significant expansion of labor supply that we're going to see over the next 20, 30 years. Right? And so Southeast Asia is a major market in its own right. So that's all I have, ladies and gentlemen. Thanks very much for your attention, and I'll be happy to take questions later. <clears throat> Thank you. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. We are here because there is a vision. There is a vision of making this area bigger than Tokyo, wealthier than New York, and more innovative than San Francisco. This is a vision of the greater Bay Area, and this is a vision that has been something that we've heard over and over and over again. And the reality is, we can talk about it to death. We can actually really focus on it to death. We can analyze it to death. But none of it's going to mean anything, unless you can get business leaders on board. And ladies and gentlemen, this is actually where I come in, because I do surveys. And what we have done is conducted a survey of 101 small business leaders in Hong Kong, because we want to see how they are responding to the message. Is it getting true to them? Are they seeing opportunities? Or are they not seeing very much at all? So these are the results of my findings. First of all, it's a good news and a bad news story. We surveyed the 100 makers, and we found that SMEs here in Hong Kong are generally unsure of the GPA. They know that it has something to do with infrastructure, but what else? And they generally see little opportunity for their own companies in GBA, even if they're already operating there. In other words, even if they're already operating in the GBA, they don't see too much more opportunity there. So that's the bad news. But there is also a good news, because when you actually take the broader results and apply some machine learning algorithms to tease out some, then you actually find that you have a very substantial segment. 38% of our respondents, they will actually say, look, we see a huge amount of opportunity. And what we find is exactly consistent with what Professor Dada Lo has said. They see an opportunity to connect uh, mainland China with Southeast Asia through Hong Kong. And so that's a good news in this part of the story. And that suggests a path forward. There may be something realistic here. It's not just us academics and policy guys are just, just saying, look, uh, this is a great idea. There is some, some belief in the small business community that this could actually occur, but we need to actually make it. 
So let's actually jump into that's going to be perceptions of the GBA. And many survey respondents were not clear what the GBA actually meant. When we asked them the question, of the 101 SME business leaders, the number one response was, I'm not sure what the GBA really means. They just don't know. And then another 15.8% and another 12.9% respectively said infrastructure development and its government modernization. So what is this telling us? There isn't a very strong understanding in the business community even of what the GBA actually means. And nearly half of respondents' companies had no coherent view of the GBA. Others actually viewed the GBA as a gateway to the mainland China market and a production base. But once again, there isn't a coherent view. And finally, 40% uh, of respondents said that their companies have little to offer to GBA uh, clients. Some other companies thought so. But what's striking is that 30% of companies that already had business, op business operations there actually didn't think they had much to offer. How can this be? Turns out that like there's actually something deeper here, something more interesting to look at, you wouldn't ever get from just looking at the overall survey results. So what's more important is that you actually look at the details and try to use sophisticated algorithms to tease out the details. And this is actually a process, of course, in consulting, we call it market segmentation. And we applied a, say, a combination of algorithms, and we found some very interesting results. There are at least four different types of respondents to our survey. So there are at least four different segments in the broader population of um, these SMEs. One population are more service providers. Uh, they're in the business of like import-export, but there are more consultants, or they're actually more representatives, or they're in the business of actually providing services to other import-export businesses. There is a second segment of manufacturing within the uh, trading industry, and that's about 30% of respondents, and they really have no idea what the GBA means beyond the manufacturing sector, because that's what they use it for, and they're unenthusiastic. They're very much like another segment of 27% of respondents that have no sense whatsoever what the GBA means, and frankly, they just don't care. And finally, you have 6% uh, of traditional bookkeepers, the little mom and pop book bookkeeper types that are so important to Hong Kong economies. They're like, yes, we can actually sell audit services to them, as you might expect, right? So while these other three segments are quite important, I would like to focus on the 38% of respondents who are service providers within the trading industry. They have lots of different ideas what the GBA means, but they have some idea. And they recognize the GBA's potential to connect greater China with Southeast Asia and beyond. So let's take a look at these guys. First of all, nearly half of respondents view the GBA as a gateway into China. And many SMEs in this segment also viewed as a, the GBA as a gateway from China into Hong Kong. They see it going both ways. It's a way, it's a door into China, it's a door out of China into Southeast Asia. Exactly what Donald was proposing. And once again, you're actually getting the same kind of results. So that like I don't want to run over time, let me actually summarize real quick here. So it's a good news, bad news kind of story. There's a lot of companies that just don't, won't be interested, but there are a lot of companies that are, and they're exactly the companies that you would want them to be interested. They're exactly the ones who are actually in import, export, wholesaling, all those kind of businesses that can link the greater area with Southeast Asia. And how do we help them? There's actually three different things we can do. One thing we can do is actually help them build connections. The downside of the results we found was that unlike a world leading company like EY, which is profoundly international in scope and abilities, um, these smaller uh, service providers, 95% of them had never actually worked outside of Hong Kong. A very, a very small percentage has actually worked in, uh, what's gonna call it, uh, the greater barrier uh, mainland cities. And none of our respondents had ever worked in Southeast Asia. So there is something the government must do to kind of like help them out. And the government and the Hong Kong SAR has built an extensive network of trade offices through Southeast Asia. 
maybe they can actually be helpful here because they don't have a connection. Uh, besides that, there's always these uh, issues like taxes and regulatory harmonization that small businesses are worried about that should be also addressed too. But I'll stop here and I'll turn the floor over to our distinguished panelists from um, Invest Hong Kong. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, I hope you can hear me. Oh, okay. Uh, thank you, Agnes, for inviting, and uh, Jasmine and Andrew for inviting uh, Invest Hong Kong to participate in this uh, seminar webinar. And I hope our sharing can be of use, of value to you. And uh, as Agnes mentioned earlier, the uh, last week, uh, as last week, uh, the delegation from uh, central government pointed out Hong Kong actually have a very important role to play in the coming 14 5 year plan. Uh, we have traditional role, financial center, trade center, logistics center, both business professional centers. But beyond that, actually there are four new roles assigned to Hong Kong, which are indeed uh, four main opportunities uh, coming for Hong Kong. One is for Hong Kong to be an INT hub. As uh, Professor Donald mentioned, uh, Hong Kong has always lagged behind in R&D spending, and the government is trying a lot to catch up and working closely with uh, the central government. And also a new uh, aviation hub, a intellectual property trading hub, and also a arts and cultural uh, exchange hub. So all these four new ideas, four new roles for Hong Kong, actually provide a lot of business exciting opportunities for uh, the years to come. So uh, my presentation may briefly touch on the, uh, the role of Hong Kong in the GBA. What's it in for Hong Kong? What's in for the audience, for businesses from over overseas and local? So. Hong Kong has a difficult two, three years, but uh, Hong Kong continues to be an attractive destination for overseas investment. This is a report from the United Nations CTAD, the UNTED report, Hong Kong continues to be the number three destination of attracting overseas uh, FDI. You may wonder why people would choose Hong Kong. Of course, uh, companies and money come to Hong Kong, not only for Hong Kong, the reason is this, this is the situation that has been for many, many years. Hong Kong is a gateway in and out of China. So this role has not changed much for many years and we expect it continues to be so. And why is that? One of the reason is the, as some of you may have heard, the due circulation strategy announced last year by the central government. Uh, in just is the, the main focus of the mainland economy will be the domestic market to build up the domestic market, which drive the all many of the recent policy announcement you heard, especially in the past month, all of these are to boost the domestic circulation. And there is of course an international circulation is overseas investment and overseas trade, the Bell and Mode initiative, so all of these two, these two circular circulation is actually intertwined. And Hong Kong play a role exactly at the juncture of these two circulation. We can help mainland companies go global through Hong Kong. They go through Hong Kong to go sell their products overseas, to go expand along the Belt and Road. And also for international companies and international money to grow into Hong Kong and then to the GBA and to mainland China as a whole. Why Hong Kong? These are things we, for us, so of us who live in Hong Kong, we know one country, two system, our location, our low tax. I won't waste our time on it. And um, these are an interesting roles that, uh, maybe I should stand over here, um, that we play, uh, that may be gone, sometimes gone unnoticed. We do a survey in West Hong Kong every year 
surveying the number of companies or non-local companies operating in Hong Kong, those from mainland China and from overseas. There are 9,000 such companies operating in Hong Kong, 1,500 that regional headquarters are in Hong Kong. Continues to be so. Last year, we are doing this year's survey right now. We expect the number to more or less stable. Hong Kong is still a, a prime des investment destination. He's a launch pad for B2C, B2B operation from Hong Kong to GBA with the rest of the world, especially increasingly so from Asia, and we'll talk about more later. R&D, the government has spent billions and billions of dollars to promote R&D in Hong Kong. We give a lot of tax break as well. We have good universities that do great fundamental research that cannot be found in elsewhere in the GBA. We are next door to Shenzhen, a great area for prototyping and for mass manufacturing. So Hong Kong has a lot of to, to, um, to offer more especially in the, uh, intellectual property trading. And as all you are aware, we are top IPO destination for many years. Uh, we help a lot of companies raise a lot of fun. So these are many unique business functions for Hong Kong right now for many years and for the past and also continue to be so in the development of the GBA. So in the, in the interest of time, I will briefly go through what are the opportunities of different business sector? Uh, I hope the audience from the various background can at least uh, some uh, brief takeaway. Hong Kong is working closely with Shenzhen in uh, building a technology park in uh, Lok Ma Chao Loop that will come uh, operational in the two or three years. We are already working, uh, the Hong Kong Science Park is already working closely with Shenzhen to building a temporary park in uh, Shenzhen and a lot of facilitation measures where with the central government to allow funding from the central government from mainland and Hong Kong to in the flow to increase collaboration with the two two regions this is the uh, there are a lot of science and technology song in the mainland in the GDB uh, GBA we just list some of of these parks that are working with our Hong Kong science park so there are a lot of opportunity for people to do R&D in Hong Kong and to collaborate with the uh, mainland GBA cities. This is the uh, Lok Major Loop I talk about. It's a lot, it's a, uh, quite a large area that it comes with operational in 24, 24 and beyond. And uh, for financial services, of course, the increasingly wealthy consumers, uh, 86 million of them, there are more higher network individuals, ultra high network individuals that makes all these stock connect, insurance connect, wealth management connect, so excited for um, clients of UI and for financial institution. It's the underlying figures of the, the increasing really wealthy consumer and uh, high network individuals. We are all looking forward to Wealth Management Connect, hopefully announced to be announced soon. I don't have inside information. Of it. Uh, so I hope it is the soon. Uh, it's uh, the soon is I, what I've been saying for uh, quite a while. <laughs> and for business and professional service, including uh, services provided by EY, it's a world class in Hong Kong that help mainland companies and also companies from all over the world who want to expand into the mainland, but at least have some operation in Hong Kong to manage their money, to manage their operation, to manage their finances and, and legal arbitration, whatnot. Hong Kong continues to play a very significant role. And Hong Kong professional, uh, there are more and more facilitation measures for Hong Kong professionals to work in the GBA, whereas legal, accountants, architects, engineers, there are more and more to come. Uh, I won't go into detail, I'm sure a lot of people are familiar with them. And for the most easy and the common uh, way we, and we sell to overseas companies to invest in the GBA is to sell your product using cross-border e-commerce. You don't have to set any operation here. You just use our cross-border e-commerce platform. You can test your product in the GBA and see whether they like it or not. And then you can expand, set up self-office or whatnot in, in the GBA. 
，即係 low hanging hanging fruit 裏面啊。I recommend to certain sector, the R and B, F and B sector, the retail sectors, for them to do. And there are a lot of other opportunities. There are really not much、uh, so-called regulations or hindrance by the by the、uh, public sector on development or F and B food service consumer product or not. So there are really Not difficult for overseas companies to expand into this region, and、uh, given all these opportunities, as the two professor mentioned, there are still we need to do more, a lot of more, on the Greater Bay Area to increase awareness for locally and also more importantly globally on the opportunities of GBA, what it means for them, and also how to sell GBA more to the world. And this is what the、uh, policy address and assign the、uh, Invest Hong Kong to do is to work with our counterpart, other investment promotion agency in the region, to work closely together, to join hands together, and we go and sell GBA as a team. This is the liaison group that we are、uh, we have been tasked、uh, to do. And、um, another way we hope to in,、uh, introduce GBA, the government have a, a Greater Bay Area office. They have a general website on all aspects of、uh, GBA. Whether you want to retire there, you want to study in the GBA, why not? We have a dedicated website. It's mostly on investment, the mainland policy,、uh, new announcement. We hope to translate partially into English and in more business-friendly language for them to understand. At least get a general idea what Chef Fu Shan has to offer, what Zhu Hai has to offer. We also have a LinkedIn articles. If you like to connect with me, I have published LinkedIn articles weekly to explain some of the、uh, opportunities and the new policy in、uh, plain English. And、uh, if you miss Hong Kong, as you are aware, we are the、uh, government department to promote overseas investment into Hong Kong. We help companies from the planning stage set up, launch, aftercare. We do a one-stop service. All our services are free of charge, confidential, and、uh, tailor-made. I hope、uh, anyone will be interested, especially audience from overseas.、Uh, feel free to connect with us.、Uh, we are happy to be of service, and I look forward to the、uh, discussion session. Thank you very much. Well, I'm the moderator, as I mentioned.、Uh, Thank you very much for the briefing and you know all the information that you have shared with us. A lot of、um, good、uh, insights and also、uh, the decks are you know really、uh, very detailedly prepared,、uh, giving us a lot of、uh, good stuff. So、uh, I hope to have a very、uh, you know interesting、uh, panel discussion,、um, and I hope you know we can have about twenty、uh, minutes to、uh, to conduct uh, this this、uh, panel discussion session. Now、um, I actually. Do take a good look at all the decks, and I particularly like you know one of the, the slides there. So please, can you help me、uh, land on this, Professor Donald? All、oh, right. I like this、uh, slide a lot.、Uh, I love the、uh, you know the man who's riding the bicycle. A very good、um, you know impression there, and all the wording is there. So、um, you know, in fact, I I read you know both of your reports, and you have actually give us、uh, you know very good、uh, recommendations as you mentioned. As to how Hong Kong can actually be uh, uh, doing its best to maintain and even be increasing its distinctiveness, as you have mentioned a lot in in you know both of your reports. So,、mm. I would love to hear probably you know、uh, have you elaborated a little bit more on one or two areas that you think you know、uh, all of us here in Hong Kong can actually do and even work better on.、Mm, yeah, yeah, that's a hard part, right? What do we do next? <laughs>、uh, Uh, I, mean, I was just having a chat with David just now, and I asked him how how old is、uh, Invest Hong Kong, and he says twenty、uh, years old, which is a baby、huh, by the standards of economic、uh, promotion agencies. I'm I come from Singapore, so in Singapore, one of the most institutionalized of these public sector agencies is something called the EDB. So your counterpart、yes. in Singapore is called the Economic Development Board, and that's been around almost sixty years.、Uh, so I think that that. Little anecdote reflects the very di different DNA of Hong Kong and Singapore.、Uh, Hong Kong, Singapore is a much more、uh, engineered economy, where the state plays this very important role in terms of setting strategic guidance, identifying new opportunities, channeling resources, allocate. Sometimes it gets gets it wrong. 
uh, but oftentimes it gets it right. I mean, the, the 18% of GDP I showed that is still in manufacturing in Singapore is a reflection of this very activist industrial planning and policy. Uh, Hong Kong takes a far more, they say it's not quite the right word, a far more relaxed approach. Things happen more organically. Uh, things evolve. Uh, so you trade away speed, but things are also a lot more efficient, I think, in Hong Kong. There's very li few, there's relatively little wasted resources. Although well, I shouldn't be too quick to say that. <laughs> uh, so I think it, it, it reflects very different DNA. Uh, but I think one, one thing Hong Kong must do, and, and I think most economists are agreed uh, on that. This is something, is, is a proper role of the state, is to tr really try to create, try to capture some of these learning spillovers that new research creates, uh, try to foster a more conducive startup environment. So, you know, I, I would say one, one critical priority for Hong Kong is really to cultivate, to foster a much more dynamic research, innovation and enterprise ecosystem. Uh, this is critical because we are, you know, as everybody knows, we are in the midst of, uh, you know, the fourth industrial revolution. And I, I fear that if Hong Kong doesn't take a much more aggressive activist approach to this, it becomes just a, 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 a laggard, right? A, a, at best, a, a quick adopter, but not really at the cutting edge of uh, new, te new, te new technology developments. And many, and in many ways, the, 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 some of the ingredients of this research, innovation, and enterprise ecosystem are already in Hong Kong. Financing, right? Uh, top class research universities, uh, sound protection of intellectual property rights. So I think it's really trying to integrate, connecting the dots, pulling all this together and injecting new resources and a certain sense of urgency uh, that that uh, that Hong Kong needs to do uh, in, in order to carve out a, a distinctive niche as this place for not just research, but also innovation and, uh, and, and new enterprises. Sure, thank you. So, uh, Donald, you think, you know, you, you're very correct. The uh, innovation part is actually very important. Now, I, I would want to further probably uh, elaborate a, a, a bit more by David, as you're actually uh, representing the government. Can I say oh, that? Okay. Uh, you <laughs> the government to really, you know, push this forward. And, and, I, and I actually understand that a lot of things have been actually going on, you know, with, with the government driving a lot of innovation stuff, like, you know, with our cyber board, with our science park, and you know, all these things are actually do happening. Uh, do, they are actually happening in Hong Kong. So, David, what, what, is, what is your view on this? Yes, uh, thank, thank you. Um, really, uh, the R&T, Hong Kong has been lacking behind R&D, R&D for the R&D sectors for, for many years, and at least for this term of government, and before that, there has been a really a government laser focus on the focus on R&D. You can uh, hear from all the speeches and all the money that has been provided in the in the several the policy address and uh, the budget speech on the infrastructure building, attracting talent, uh, R&D tax sources, uh, subsidies, and more collaboration with our mainland counterparts. And uh, in the 14 five year plan, the, the delegation uh, last week, one of the talk is on uh, focus is on uh, R&D as well. So the, the agency is certainly there. And the, also the amount of resources and the determination it's also there. Uh, in, in, Mass, in Mass Hong Kong, we have uh, two teams, one on startup and one on fintech. We not only promote fintech and startup to overseas, we also been tasked to uh, nurture the e uh, ecosystem of startup and uh, fintech. We do a survey of number of startups in Hong Kong, also on the fintech, not as a as robust as the, it's just a general survey on the number of startups and fintech, which are all also growing. In Hong Kong, is the improving uh, ecosystem. There are a lot of things that catch up to do, but uh, all these are progressing. Uh, and the pro and the, if you are uh, more interested to know, uh, check out with Stan Park and Cyberport. They have a lot of scheme, a lot of mentoring scheme, funding scheme, incubating scheme, and a lot of uh, uh, financial support. Uh, Provides a seed funding, a matching, whatnot. So uh, the ecosystem is actually quite vibrant for startup and fintech in Hong Kong. Mm -hmm. Sure, I I actually uh because you know because uh as as a partner we actually also always converse with you know different parties in the business world and um you know uh, business community and we we do hear feedback a lot of times you know um with with uh you know people talking about you know how they start up companies in Hong Kong is it is it difficult or is it easy or 
Uh, are there any, like, you know, they're not saying complaints, but they also actually have a lot of uh, different feedback. So, in fact, if you know, there are any questions on the floor, you know, from audiences, uh, feel free to ask um, David at the end after our panel discussion. Oh, well, so fast. We already have questions? Okay. Let's wait after my panel discussion. So, okay. Now, the next um, question that I want to refer to is I want to borrow uh, David's stack here. Uh, this is a very good picture that actually depicts a uh, ideal scenario, right? Which a lot of us would actually want uh, to have this, you know, dual circulation mechanism going on as in the nicest way uh, that you can. So uh, I would want to first ask, you know, uh, David, to what extent do you think Hong Kong is actually um, positioning itself right now uh, to make this happen and even happen, even happen better in the future? What's your view on that? Okay, uh, I briefly touched on this slide uh, because of time, I didn't go into much detail. The main circulation is the domestic circulation. From the mainland Chinese economy point of view, it is a large economy and increasingly so with a huge number of consumers and increasingly wealthy and increasing uh, household wages. So that would be the main part, main key driver of the mainland economy in the years to come. So that presents an opportunity for overseas companies who want to sell their products and services into mainland China. They will be take advantage of an increasingly uh, larger market. So Hong Kong, what Hong Kong can play? Hong Kong roles in this trade has all has and always been, as I mentioned in the other slide, is a funnel, is a channel for inward investment for companies who want to set up. In the mainland, they go through Hong Kong. For the international circulation, is it is not as important, at least from the planning uh, Chinese central government planning perspective, is because of the uh, the virus and the economic slowdown that happened globally. But that's still an important role. They create a lot of export jobs and also a lot of market for the mainland companies who want to go global. There are a lot of huge domestic and state-owned companies who want to go global. And for those companies who want to go global, the best, they have a lot of problems to at least talking. One, they need uh, to manage their money offshore RMB. They need to manage their proceeds from the local currency or the US dollar. They need accounting, they need to do tax. They need to have to sign contract, legal contract, and they have to manage their people. So all of these require professional services. Hong Kong can provide. I'm just make, naming very simple exa uh, examples, and or one, one of the many reasons, uh, the angles of Hong Kong, is for the Hong Kong and play in helping mainland companies go global, which is one of our tasks for Invest Hong Kong. We have a dedicated team to help mainland companies to global and to uh, make, make them happy and stay in Hong Kong. So this is, of course, the IPO and whatnot, which is of, of uh, the state obvious. So I don't know how this is a circulate, circulation where Hong Kong really set in the center. We, we take advantage of the, the, the of full, both ways. Yeah, exactly. Thank you, David. We actually want, we all actually want Hong Kong to be the, um, the platform and also the springboard, right? For companies to go actually uh, smoothly between Hong Kong and the rest of the world. Now, I want to, you know, set up a question for the Professor JC because you you do have a chance to talk to a lot of, you know, business leaders and and entrepreneurs and and what what's their view about this? You know, what what's their perception about Hong Kong being the uh, what we call like a investment connect? Um, do do what what's their what's their feeling on on this one? Well, I actually speak more with the people that are actually not as much in finance. I'm sure there's half a dozen people in here who are more qualified to talk about that I am. But I have heard a few things. And I think there's still a perception in some respects where Chinese investors are willing to come out to Hong Kong, but they may not be willing to go further. And I want to actually relay an example I had coming in from the other side. Uh, a couple of years ago, I was in, uh, involved in, with an event where there was actually a delegation of senior Indian uh, business leaders, actually especially in the startup ecosystem, including the heads of Thai and NASCOM, 
who actually came into Hong Kong and spoke at the Asia Society. And there was actually a second part of the trip that actually uh, took everybody who was actually participating from Hong Kong into Shenzhen. The number of people from India who came to Hong Kong, it was quite impressive, about 20 to 30 of them, including some of the most senior VCs and so forth. Mm -hmm. And the number of people who actually made it to uh, Shenzhen, three. So I think there's an important role to be played here. Um, I can't say as much as about the uh, finance side of things, but in terms of innovation, entrepreneurship, mm -hmm. and the market research, I can actually tell you a lot more that there is a role to be played in Hong Kong because there just isn't any other GBA city able to play these international connector roles. Well, okay. That's very encouraging to hear you know, from, from Professor JC. And, and Professor uh, Domino, uh, you, you actually uh, did also indicate in your second report um, with regards to how actually Hong Kong can better link up with ASEAN, right? Because it, you know, uh, ideally speaking, it should be a springboard for companies to go, you know, via Hong Kong to the ASEAN. So, can you elaborate a little bit more on, on this? What would you think? Yeah, this is hard. This is the hard part, right? Uh, just because something is possible and desirable, Hong Kong is a springboard as the connect the super connector, as Agnes uh, so uh, articulately put it. Uh, just because something is possible and desirable doesn't mean it will necessarily happen. Right, so I think I think we all agree that it's entirely possible, uh, and it's extremely economically beneficial for Hong Kong to be this to play this super connector role. Uh, but there are certain obstacles, there are certain impediments. First, of course, is the fact that Southeast Asia is extremely diverse, uh, and the existing expertise. Whereas, even though it's true that Hong Kong has got a long history uh, of linkages with Southeast Asia, it's uh, its edge cannot be taken for granted, right? Uh, uh, second, Hong Kong doesn't really have uh, the kind of institutional linkages, institutional networks that position it well to go into a market like Southeast Asia. Uh, so this is something it needs to invest in, right? So by, by that, I mean uh, business chambers, I mean think tanks that work on uh, Southeast Asia, that understand Southeast Asia, uh, an outward orientation that this is where our, you know, uh, economic future lies. That's still, that's still, uh, uh lacking. Uh, Hong Kong is re relatively international. It's got a well-developed financial sector, but there, there is in this sense that, you know, we have to be a lot more aggressive in entering emerging markets, exploiting opportunities there, setting up businesses, thinking of cross-border partnerships. That, that's still, that's still, uh, uh, lacking. Uh, so, so I think there's still lots of work, uh, to be done creating these, uh, building these networks and creating this, you know, vibrant, uh, 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 uh platform, right? That, that would allow both Southeast Asian companies to access, as JC was saying, access the mainland. But also, uh, allowing, enabling mainland companies as well as Hong Kong companies to go into Southeast Asia. Uh, one way government can facilitate that is to sort of, you know, broaden the, what we are targeting, right? So, in addition to GDP, right? Uh, I, I don't know if this, this is done. Maybe David can, uh, uh enlighten us. Uh, do we look at Hong Kong's GNP, which, you know, we look at Hong Kongers, uh, firms and residents, uh, Income from from you know outside of Hong Kong, so so that that would give a put put some focus on our international and our internationalization efforts, uh, and 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 how are we faring on on GNP. Yeah, I don't have the figures on hand. I think the census. I think that's yeah, sure similar. Yeah, sure yeah. that's also an, another indicator that we can look at. That's right. Yeah, which help us measure. Okay, now the, I, I think I'm going to, because of the, you know, the interest of time, uh, I'm going to have the uh, last question, you know, for the panel discussion. Now, um, I think, um, actually, I think a lot of, um, people in Hong Kong right now are, you know, doing our very best to penetrate the GBA and, uh, make sure we won't lag behind, you know, on this, on this campaign and this competition. Uh, for example, uh, quoting, you know, UI ourselves, uh, we're doing a lot already, uh, under the leadership of Agnes. Uh, for example, uh, last year we've already done a youth mobility program, uh, which we are giving you know um, students from Hong Kong and also as well as from, from the southern China region to actually share experiences and work together. Uh, like uh, last month, we've actually also you know conducted the uh, our first GBA summit, uh, which is uh, actually a huge success with simultaneous you know panels going on in Shenzhen and also in Hong Kong, you know online real time basics. So that's what we call connect connection. 
And this is a very important aspect. So uh, I'm sure, you know, uh, government has been doing a lot, you know, as, as what David has said. And um, I just I just want to, you know, give give our speakers, you know, um, the opportunity to, you know, to present your view. What can we further do to, you know, promote this GBA campaign even more uh, from your perspective? The GBA promotion aspect is, is very, it's very important, right? Yeah. Allow me to, uh, since yeah. the slide is up, uh, allow me to do more. <laughs> Actually, yeah, uh, not, to, be, to be honest, if you look at uh, us, the uh, overseas audience about the GBA, I think most people haven't heard about GBA. We scream about GBA every day in Hong Kong, but for uh, European companies or uh, American companies, or they uh, begin to grasp the general idea from the Japanese companies and Southeast Asian companies that we talk, we talk with. So there are a lot of uh, promotion uh, to be done. That's number one. And also the second question that we are commonly get asked, what's the difference between GBA and the Pearl River Delta? <laughs> you guys have been talking for 40 years already. Uh, the, the, uh, the, 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 the short answer is that the GBA is different because there is a coordinated policy innovation. And that is coming up from the central government and from the Guangdong, Hong Kong and Macau. This has never happened before. There is more and more GBA policies coming in every month from different small sectors, subsectors, drip by drip coming. And the GBA today is different from GBA next year and the GBA two years from now. So I think this is a really the most interesting part about the GBA. It's not static, this is dynamic, it is growing. So I think there are a lot of promotion to do. I back to my original point. A lot of promotion to do for overseas investors, actually for local audience as well. A lot of companies, they, especially if they border closure, uh, I'm head of GB, I haven't been to GB for too long, very, very too long. <laughs> so um, I think there are a lot for local companies, for local um, audience, for business company, and for the ordinary citizens also. So this concept is new, only two years old. But uh, I think there's a lot of uh, room to grow, mm -hmm. and especially when people see more and more real life examples, case studies for business. So we are trying hard to create more case studies. At least there will be a great, greater sense of uh, knowledge and understanding. Sure. Thank you, David. Professor JC, uh, with some of the statistics that you have shown us, you know, what, what's your recommendation? Well, I think, I mean, we can look at statistics all we want, and we can actually have top-down initiatives, and I think they're helpful. But I actually think, in the end, whether or not there is a meaningful GBA entity will depend on the people. Mm -hmm. It has to come from bottom up. So is there actually a real reason, a real opportunity, a real rationale for people to start actually thinking about like a GGBA in Hong Kong, kind of like uh, the ocean and rivers are for salmon? Sometimes you swim upstream and sometimes you go downstream into the ocean, right? Mm -hmm. So for instance, I know that there's one person in the room who actually uh, graduated from Hong Kong UST, went north of the border, uh, did some work there, uh, just raised uh, 1.5 million of venture capital, US, mm -hmm. and then came back to Hong Kong to kind of like establish a more international business, right? Mm -hmm. uh, is there, are there more opportunities like this? And I think what I really want to emphasize is that the like, policies are good, visions are good, but in the end, we have to make it work for people. Sure. Yeah. And last but not least, Donald, I, I particularly like the point on, that you mentioned in the report about think tanks. <laughs> uh, that you think associations and think tanks can do play a big part? In oh, I'm entirely self-interested. I run a think tank. So, <laughs> oh, okay, that's wonderful. Okay. So, Donald, do you have anything to add on? No, I think just to add on to uh, uh, JC's point. I think it's a very important point. I think sometimes we put too much emphasis on government pronouncements and big visions. But actually, for this to succeed, it has to make sense for for the entrepreneur, for the, the Hong Kong business, uh, both small and large. And one thing I think government on across the GBA can work harder is, is on harmonization of standards uh, and to the extent possible harmonization of policies as well. This is very difficult because this is not a single economic union. Right? This is more a geographic uh, concept. Uh, but to give it substance, you to give the GBA substance, you need, I think, some harmonization of policies and as much harmonization of standards mm -hmm. and regulations as possible to facilitate flow of goods uh, flow of capital is relatively straightforward and you've got all the, you know, as you were saying, uh, all, all the connects, right? But flow of goods, flow, flow of services, which is what uh, the GBA is increasingly moving towards, 
uh, that would require much harder thinking uh, and, 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 and harmonization of standards. Yeah. All right, sure. So uh, I think this wraps up our panel discussion. Thank you very much for, for all your comments. Um, I think we do have time. You know, it's, it's not yet 5.15. So we can have um, questions from the floor. I do have one question coming in from the uh, virtual attend uh, the audience, so I want to see whether there are any questions on the floor right now. Um, how countries in the world uh, advance economy or emerging market com economies are facing uh, mega trends? Uh, you mentioned globalization, digitalization, and population aging. Uh, how Hong Kong, as one of the cities in the area, that to prepare itself to deal with these uh, mega trends and. Um, what are the advantages and risks for Hong Kong? Thank you. Yeah, so the first report tries to address that. Uh, there are obviously are significant advantages with agglomeration uh, and of course with greater con connectivity, right? access to a larger market. And this is Hong Kong's hinterland, right? I mean, I come from Singapore and we always lament the fact that we don't have a real hinterland. Hong Kong is a fantastic hinterland. Uh, it's, you know, this is... Uh, Hong Kong's great fortune. So of course you should take advantage of that. But with, along with agglomeration comes certain risks. Uh, we've seen, uh, I mentioned some of those, the risk of hollowing out, the, the risk of talent moving to, you know, where the economic opportunities are. Uh, also, one, one thing which I would like to, one, one thing my center would probably want to study further is who are the winners and losers in this, uh, agglomeration? Uh, it's not the case that all the participants in the urban agglomeration would benefit. So for instance, when the high-speed rail between Tokyo and uh, Osaka was established, Tokyo obviously benefited a lot, Osaka also benefited to some extent, but virtually everybody lost out. Uh, virtually everybody else lost out, right? Because as they lost talent, as they lost people, economic activities move, you know, alongside with population aging, exactly what you were saying. So I would like to see more about these distributional consequences. The, the pie grows bigger, but how that pie is distributed uh, matters, right? And, and then, of course, we see that in uh, the, react the backlash against the European Union, for instance. Part of it is driven by distributional concerns. So I think a lot more thinking needs to be... We are at the very early stage of GBA integration. Uh, and I think, as of now, the benefits far outweigh those risks and those costs. But at some stage... We, we have to start thinking about, you know, the, alongside those benefits and uh, advantages of agglomeration, what are some of the uh, maybe hidden costs and, 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 and some risks that we had not anticipated? We have to start thinking about those too. Thank you. I think there's one more question at the back. JC, you wanted to talk on David? Sure, I can probably say a little bit while we I am. look for another question. I mean, the question is, which mega trend are you talking about? And I'll actually throw out one. Uh, we talk a lot about a globalization, and what most people don't realize is that if you look at the numbers, whether it be trade or whether it be more along the lines of corporate affiliations, 80% of what we call globalization has always been regionalization. And there's indications that regionalization may strengthen as a trend, while connections across regions may weaken. How would actually uh, Hong Kong take advantage of this? It's a good question. I think a GBA could be actually a part of the answer. Mm, yeah. But I think it's something I'd like to leave it to the other speakers. Okay. Another question? Come here. Uh, hello? Yeah. Hi, thank you for your talk. Um, this is really insightful. My name is Garbutt. I'm studying from the University College London. So I had a question. I believe it was Donald. Um, did you mention that there needs to be a harmonization of policies? Could you please elaborate on that and how that would look like with the GBA union? Yeah, the thing is, I think most people would agree that one of the benefits of these uh, regional integration efforts is you reduce barriers, right, to movement of goods and services. And of course, that's facilitated by common standards, common rules, and, and, and all of that. Uh, as far as, I'm con as far as I know, the GBA hasn't, the big emphasis hasn't been on that. Right? The big emphasis on GBA has been really on facilitating movement of people uh, with all these um, uh, infrastructure uh, improvements, I mean, the high-speed rail and all of that, the, the bridge and all of that. Uh, but I suspect the much greater benefit to these uh, regionalization or agglomeration efforts is in the software. 
right? Where, where, you know, yeah, when you have common standards, right? Or you at least harmonize standards that would facilitate, uh, you know, I, I produce a product, you know, does it comply with the standards in, in the, in, in the, in the mainland? Does it comply with the standards in the GBA or, uh, they, you know, somebody builds a, 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 uh, uh, an app in the in, in the mainland does it comply with the the standards and 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 the rules that we have here and you know whether they can whether products or services can these move easily across uh, across uh, the, the the greater Bay Area so so and you need to do this sector by sector industry by industry the other harmonization of standards has to be in tax for instance how do we treat uh, sources of income across different uh, tax jurisdictions uh, all these. You know, this, this is the hard work of integration. It's relatively easy to get the infrastructure links up. Much harder to get the, you know, things like taxes. How do we treat different sources of income? You know, much harder to do that well, but it's very important to do those things well. Yeah, I, I totally agree. The, uh, the work in progress is the uh, harmonization, the four elements, the people, goods, uh, capital, and uh, information. Yeah. So uh, the, the four people uh, without the COVID, has been quite vastly improving in the past two, three years. Uh, the flow of capital, uh, so we have the, oh, that's why all the connect scheme are coming. Uh, on the, the flow of people, that's where all the uh, scheme for letting people to, uh, Hong Kong people to work, entrepreneur, retire in the mainland. So, and for the free flow of information, there are more and more connect, connect, uh, Oh, data connect. Data connect. So, I, I saw the <laughs> so, right? yeah, uh, so, uh, so, so these are working progress, as I said. Yeah, I guess. Can I ask a question? <laughs> of course, of course, time is not up yet. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we, we just forget about time. <laughs> no, I, I wanted to um, uh, understand a little bit more on our set. You know, uh, in November last year, um, the biggest trade block was created. You know, by the signing of 15 member states uh, to the regional uh, comprehensive economic partnership uh, in ASEAN. You know, at the virtual ASEAN summit uh, uh, conducted by Vietnam. Mm -hmm. So uh, China uh, was a party to it, and uh, you know, this um, you know, this trade block actually, uh, you know, the, the 15 member states on on ASEAN represented 30 percent of the world population and 30 percent of the global GDP. So a real big one. And in China, uh, Hong Kong is, no, uh, is not yet a party to our set. But and yet, I read some article that, uh, in fact, the trade trading between Hong Kong and ASEAN almost uh, uh, contributes to about 70% of Hong Kong's trade. So very, very significant. So I think this topic is very relevant as to how um, you know the Hong Kong's role uh, in terms of a closer link with ASEAN. So I, I just like to ask the, the panelists, uh, so, so how far are we from uh, concluding our own our set, you know, being a party to our set? Or, or what else can we do, um, you know, in, in terms of this very significant trading volume already with ASEAN? And, and it's really a very complicated uh, region, uh, uh, you know, and, and Professor Lo mentioned about harmonization. Harmonizing within GBA is already quite difficult, although we just have two systems. Uh, and free currency. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but how do you do with the ASEAN team member states? So, so over to you, uh, Oh, thank you, Agnes. Uh, RCEP is really a very exciting idea, and uh, from what we understand, uh, the Hong Kong SAR has already expressed interest to join as soon as possible, but it's not yet fully ratified, so they are not uh, considered accepting new members yet. But uh, we are, uh, Hong Kong SAR is hopefully to be the first to join. The central government has expressed support for Hong Kong to join. So in the meantime, uh, we have our FDA with uh, ASEAN, the market, we have SEPA with the mainland. So we are trying to build uh, with Australia and New Zealand. So we hope in the meantime, that's was something that we are uh, trying to do. And uh, speaking of LCA, LCEP and uh, GDP, GBA and ASEAN, uh, there is a report recently also by a uh, think tank by the Dr. Victor Fong who use a very interesting allergy called hourglass allergy. Mm. GBA, mm. Uh, Hong Kong, and uh, ASEAN. Mm. That is, uh, we are observing a increasingly supply chain integration between GBA and ASEAN. Mm. Uh, uh, there is not much uh, research or uh, quick detailed numbers on it, 
But uh, from we, when I talk with our uh, investor clients, uh, this is something that we are observing to be a very interesting development in the coming years. Yeah, yeah, I think that we, we know who is the most opposing uh, state that's uh, opposing against our. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I haven't heard of it yet. <laughs> but uh, the chief hey, executive. Okay, the fifteen members say, you know, you have to buy items. A couple of items there. <laughs> But so far, we already have a free trade agreement with uh, most yeah. many of the already member. So uh, hopefully, it will be uh, the flower. We will be the first batch of uh, economies to add, to, to uh, join the uh, next round of uh, LCDP. Okay. Now, um, okay. If 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 nobody objects, then we will move on to the next one. I do want to proceed with this one. This, this is quite interesting. So besides ASEAN and besides a GDP, GDP, a G G B A. Uh, somebody actually may remind us there's uh, something called Hainan high, high high Zone. So this, here comes the question from the uh, virtual audience. Um, Hainan's free trade port has been open for 14 months and it may be a competing mainland window in Hong Kong. So um, the audience uh, you know, is asking, you know, uh, which part of Hainan, you know, it, well, it's actually they're actually promoting you know, their own uh, free trade zone uh, uh, campaigns. Uh, which part of Hainan are we actually more concerned about, or or any any other suggestions as to you know what 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 should we should be paying attention to? I think it's a question com comparing between Hainan and, and GBA or Hong Kong. So I. Uh, Dennis, do you? Yes, have no one. I, I try to answer the question. Uh, we uh, from what we understand so far. Hainan, a free trade zone, is uh, very attractive to mainland consumers because they get uh, mm. low tax and buy cosmetics <laughs> and everything uh, from there. They seem to, uh, especially for uh, since the mainland, mainlanders cannot go overseas abroad, uh, Hainan is very interesting with that. Uh, a lot of grand plans uh, have been uh, assigned to Hainan. Uh, wants to do, uh, hopes to achieve a lot of good uh, things. Uh, it's still in the early stage. I don't want to uh, just, uh, look down on Hainan or discount uh, or to raise Hong Kong profile to the sky. But uh, there are a lot of differences in this different stage of development uh, as of now. Yeah. So I, uh, Hainan, of course, as in all cities, uh, all regions have uh, their own potential and uh, a lot of own opportunities. But uh, for now, uh, uh, all I can say is that it's still uh, to be seen. The, the opportunity and the development is still to be seen. I can also say a little bit about this. Uh, in general, without actually going too much into specifics about Hong, Hong Kong and Hainan, uh, infrastructure can easily be replicated, right? You build a port facility in Hainan, is it more efficient? Is it actually cheaper to go through Hainan than China? Yeah, that might make a lot of sense. But what's actually really hard to replicate are the people, the connections, and the culture. And Hong Kong has a um, workforce that's actually not only well-educated, but a lot more international than the mainland so far. Hong Kong also has better connections than any other part of China. And then finally, Hong Kong has a very international mindset and culture that can't easily be replicated. So anything that involves any one of those three factors, I would suspect that it would be very hard to replicate. Okay. So I guess in the... Wait, wait, time's up. <laughs> okay, because uh, yeah. So th th thank you very much for the uh, you know uh, our panelists and uh, you know all our guests, uh, you know participation and um, yeah. Just uh, thank, thank you and uh, good evening to all of you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you.